Hi everyone, my name is Isabella and I'm super excited to be joining everyone at PyCon APAC 2021. I'm coming all the way from Seattle, Washington in the United States. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you guys about mechanical keyboards, um, how they work, uh, why we love them, and how you can get started in this hobby and build your own keyboards. Um, before we kind of dive into all that, I wanna give a quick intro on myself. Um, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I work on a um, design system and component library for internal products. And as you can see behind me, I have a lot of mechanical keyboards. Uh, so I'm super excited to uh, share all of this with you guys. Um, I, aside from my day job, I, I love building things with my hands, um, furniture, Legos. You can see a Lego typewriter behind me under all of my real keyboards. Um, and that's what really sparked that love for mechanical keyboards was it's something that I can make look beautiful and I can build with my own hands. Um, and it actually turns out that I'm mostly known on Twitter for my tweets about mechanical keyboards. So if after the session you guys have any questions or wanna talk about keyboards or anything else technical, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I always get tagged in random threads about asking for help with how do I build a keyboard, um, what keyboard is right for me. So definitely feel free to reach out. Before diving into mechanical keyboards, I think it's important for us to first take a look at normal keyboards and so we can kind of see how those work and then compare them to mechanical keyboards um, and kind of see what the differences are and what makes mechanical keyboards so great. So here I have a Microsoft keyboard. Um, I was actually given this when I joined the company because I didn't want to tell them I have like 15 keyboards at home. Uh, so today we actually get to put it into good use. I just took it out of the box. It's brand new. Um, and so I'm going to tear it down so we can see all the parts that make up this keyboard. So normal keyboards are usually called membrane keyboards or rubber domes. And that's because they have this thin rubbery layer that sits between the circuit board and the keycaps. And you can see here that there are these metal bits on the rubber layer that match up with this metal bit on the circuit board that's directly underneath it. So when you press down on a key, the rubber squishes down and these two metal bits touch, and then the signal is sent to the computer. It's pretty straightforward. So now that we have a better idea of how membrane keyboards work, now we can take a look at mechanical keyboards. I have a few of my favorite boards um, here in front of me. Um, the ones behind me are also my favorite. They're all my favorite. Um, but I'm gonna kind of go through each of these and we'll take a close look at them um, throughout the talk so we can kind of get a better idea of what all the different kinds of keyboards are. So first things first, why do we care about membrane versus mechanical keyboards? Like at the end of the day, you press a key and then it sends a signal to your computer, the letter, or the character shows up and you're done. Um, but the beauty of mechanical keyboards is how customizable they are and how durable they are. And they really are works of art. I mean, you can see behind me, no two keyboards look the same. They come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, and are made of really durable plastics, metals, and acrylics. Um, and they use a different mechanism to send the key press signal to the computer. And this mechanism actually lets the keyboard's lifetime be expanded because they're moving parts. So let's take a deeper look at each of these areas, uh, starting with how mechanical keyboards actually work. In mechanical keyboards, instead of using that rubber layer that we saw earlier with the Microsoft board, we use switches, and this is what they look like. Here's a switch that I've opened up so we can see all of the internal bits. So there's a few main parts that make up this switch. So first there's this upside down U shape of metal um, and you can kind of see this gap between the legs. So when this gap closes, the circuit is complete and the signal is sent to the computer. So let's take a closer look at what it takes to get this gap to close. The next main component is the slider. So that's the bit that sticks out of the main housing and where we actually put the keycap on. And then if we remove the slider, we have this spring underneath 
And the spring is what creates the resistance when we push down on the switch. As we push down on the keycap, the slider moves down and compresses the spring, as we can see it right here. And that causes the bump on the left side of the slider to move that leg out of the way. So then the leg of the leaf spring touches the metal bit and completes the circuit. Then when you release the keycap, you take the pressure off the slider. So the spring pushes the slider up and the gap opens up again. So the, or the circuit breaks and the signal stops. So that's really all of the major parts of the mechanical keyboard that actually allow you to type. And between these three main components, we can customize two of them to change the way it feels like when we press down on a key to type. So I'm sure you've all heard the stereotypical mechanical keyboard that's like super loud and aggressive. And it kind of sounds something like this. But by changing the type of stem in our switch, we can actually make the keyboard much quieter or much louder. If you choose a stem with a bump, like the first two pictured here, you'll be able to feel that bump when you type. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it's loud. So you can see the switch on the left is tactile and the switch in the middle is tactile and clicky. So you can have one without the other. The only stems that will result in um, the clickiness that comes with a mechanical keyboard is the one in the middle that has this kind of floating bottom part. So you can see that the blue and the white pieces aren't connected like they are in the other switches. And then if you choose a stem without the bump, like the red one on the far right, there won't be any sort of bump or sound when you um, press down. It'll be just a smooth mo movement up and down. The other part you can customize is the mainspring. Remember that for the switch to send the signal to the computer, that stem needs to be pressed down a certain distance to let the little leg close. If your switch has a heavier spring with more resistance, it'll take more force to press the switch down. And if it has a lighter spring with less resistance, then you'll take less force to press the switch down. So the lightness or heaviest, heaviness of a switch is measured by something called the actuation force. It tells you in grams, usually, how much force you need to press the switch in order to complete the circuit. So switches usually range from about 35 grams, being a very light switch, to about 80 grams, um, which is considered to be like a very heavy switch. And I've actually gone to um, mechanical keyboard meetups in my area where people have on purpose built like super, super heavy switches, like 120 grams or something. And it is a workout to type on. So that's something definitely that you should keep in mind when you're building a keyboard. Um, if you have lighter switches, it might cause less fatigue on your hands as you're typing. There's also a couple different types of stems to look out for. The most common is MX stems, but there's also Alps and Topre stems. They don't really make a difference in the typing experience, but these are important to keep in mind because most keycaps are made for the MX stems, and so they won't be compatible with the other types of stems. So if you really want like a very customizable keyboard, then getting um, switches that support MX stems is gonna be the way to go, so you have more options for keycaps. Now that we have that background knowledge on what makes a mechanical keyboard mechanical versus a rubber dome, and we know pretty much everything there is to know about switches, we can take a closer look at all the other parts that make up a mechanical keyboard. So to have any kind of keyboard, we need a circuit board. And mechanical keyboards use PCBs, which stands for printed circuit boards. And so I actually have one right here and we'll zoom in on it and we'll be able to see um, right here, we have all of the, the slots where our switches are going to fit into. And so we can sit our switch right here into one of these um, slots. And then all we would need to do if we were going to make this PCB into a keyboard is flip the PCB around. We can see the little legs poking up out of the other side of the PCB. And we just solder these little legs from the switch directly onto the PCB. The next part of your keyboard that you can customize is the size and the layout. 
And there's a ton of different combinations. I mean, even as you can see behind me, uh, all my keyboards look different. So there's tons of variety there where you can pick what really works for you. But I'll show you a couple really popular ones that I have. So this is a keyboard by Varmillo. It's a 10 keyless. Um, so you can see here, you have kind of like the home end, page up, page down. You have the arrow keys, but you don't have um, the numpad. So this is a really popular choice. And then I'll show you something a little bit more compact. So this is a 65% keyboard. You can see that there are some arrow keys here, some extra keys um, over on this side, but everything is pretty compact. There's not a whole lot of spare keys. There's no function row at the top or anything like that. And then a little bit of a more extreme example, I have this tiny little thing that looks like a candy bar. Um, this is my Plonk and it is actually um, an ortholinear board. So you can see here, very few keys and everything is laid out in a grid fashion. So we have rows and columns instead of things being staggered like on a typical keyboard. And as you can see, all of these keys are pretty tiny. They're all one square um, except for the space as opposed to having larger keys for like enter and shift and things like that. So the main thing you wanna look out for when it comes to your PCB, whether you're building your own keyboard from scratch or buying something that's pre-built, is what kind of firmware your PCB supports. So if you wanna have a lot of flexibility with your keyboard and you wanna be able to program it with custom layouts or complex macros, um, you'll wanna make sure that your PCB supports um, one of the more popular firmwares. And so that includes QMK, TMK, VIA, or Keyboard firmware. And so these actually are, um, some of them are software, some of them are kind of like config files, but they allow you to customize each individual key on your keyboard. Um, and you can do this across multiple layers, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but other boards, like those made by Vortex, for example, um, they're still great boards, but they are much more limited in how you can program them because there's no like interface to do it. You do it on the board itself, so it's much more challenging. So now let's look a bit closer into programming the mechanical keyboards themselves. So programming is done with this concept um, called layers, and each layer defines what happens when you press a certain key. And so you keep stacking layers on top of each other. And when you press a key, the keyboard will start at the topmost layer. So in this case, we have three layers, zero, one, and two. And so you press a key, the keyboard will first look at layer two, say, do I have anything defined for this key? If yes, it'll send that value to the computer. If no, it'll go down to one, down to zero, until it finds something to send to the computer for that key. So we can actually take a look at a real example. Here we have our first layer. It's just a basic QWERTY uh, alphanumeric layer um, with the modifiers like backspace, shift, and tab, pretty standard stuff. So um, on the top of this diagram is kind of like a little ASCII representation of what this keyboard would look like physically. And on the bottom is the actual code in QMK firmware. Um, that defines the values for all of these keys. So now let's say we wanted to define a second layer to be our numpad because we don't really like to use the number row at the top. Um, so now you can see that we've stacked layer one above layer two in our diagram. And again, looking at the code section on the bottom of the diagram, we see that only the left-hand side is filled in and it's filled in with um, our operators like plus, minus, multiplication, division, and then it's filled in with the actual numbers in a grid. And then the right side is all left blank with underscores. So if we look at the ASCII chart on the top, you'll see that the left side of the board when we're in layer one has the numpad on the left, just like the definition below. And then on the right, since that definition was blank, um, we just see all of the 
typical QWERTY layer that's coming up from layer zero. And so we see all of the letters, we see space, enter, everything like that. Now that we know how all the components of our keyboard work, it's just a matter of putting everything together. So to do that, we usually use a plate. And so I have a little sample plate here. Again, it's like not a full keyboard, but it kind of gives you a good idea of what it would look like. So this plate will sit on top of this PCB right here. Um, and it kind of protects the PCB. And as I'm putting the switches on the PCB, it kind of acts as a guide because the switches snap into place here, as you can see on the plate. Um, and so that just kind of holds the switches in place as we're soldering it on. Now, a plate isn't always needed, but it's pretty common and it's usually recommended. Uh, the only thing you have to make sure is that the plate cutouts actually match the PCB since we need to line up the cutouts with each slot in the PCB where the switches would sit. So once you have your plate lined up with your PCB and you've started putting the switches in there and soldering them, once you have all the switches soldered, um, all of that's good to go, you can just put that whole bundle into um, a case and you're pretty much done. The only thing you have to make sure is that the dimensions of the case match the dimensions of the PCB, right? Because the PCB is going to sit inside the case. Um, so as you can see behind me and with all the other boards that we've looked at so far in this talk, cases come in all sorts of materials and profiles. Um, aluminum is a pretty popular choice because it's pretty heavy, du heavy duty and durable, um, but wood, acrylic, and plastic are also super popular. Um, it just kind of depends on the style that you're going for. And you can even build your own case with a 3D printer or a laser cutter. I've seen people build cases out of Legos. Um, you can also choose to go without a case. So this is my board. Um, I kind of hand soldered all of the diodes up here, all of these components. But you can see there's, there's no case. It's just this right here is the PCB. You can kind of see the switches sitting on top of the plate. Um, and that's it. There's really nothing here for protection. You can totally do just this too. So finally, once you've done all of those steps, you'll have a board that looks like one of the ones that we've seen or one of the ones you see behind me, um, but it won't have any keycaps. So now it's kind of where like the really fun part, at least for me begins. Um, I love making my keyboards feel good, sound good, but I also want them to look good. Um, and so finding the right keycap set can be like a pretty challenging task. Um, and in the keyboard community, uh, most of the purchasing is done through group buys. And so normally um, you'll find a, a keyboard kit or a keycap set that you really like, and you'll place in an order and like six months later, it'll show up and you'll be like, surprise, uh, thanks past me. Um, but so it's really important to like be diligent about looking for keycaps if you want something that's like very different or unique um, because they're kind of like a, a one and done kind of deal. So you kind of got to collect them all. Um, and when you're kind of looking out for keycap sets, there's a bunch of different styles that you can get um, and they all can kind of change the feeling of typing a little bit. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if that's important to you too. So here you can see some of the different options for um, keycap set profiles. And there's more than what I'm showing here, but this kind of gives you a good idea of what's out there. Um, here we can see OEM. This is pretty similar to what you would see like on a standard rubber dome um, keycap or keyboard. Um, and then we have DSA. Uh, you can see that they all have the same height and they're pretty uniform and um, the typing surface where you actually put your finger on is completely squared off and it's the same across all keys. And here you can see the SA profile um, keycaps and you can see that they're very sculpted from the side. So the further back um, a key is on the keyboard, the taller that keycap will be. I personally really love DSAs and essays, depending on which board I'm using. 
Um, to me, essays feel really sturdy um, and kind of give my typing a little bit of a heavier feel. And DSAs feel more light and minimalistic. So I try to pair that um, with lighter switches um, and especially try to use them in ortholinear layouts like I've done with this board. This is using DSAs. But besides the differences in their shapes, keycaps can also be made from different materials. So the most common is either ABS or PBT plastic. Um, so they're just two different kinds of plastics that react to um, heat and body oils differently. So PBT keycaps are usually considered higher quality because they don't wear as easily. They don't show shine from like oily hands um, and they also don't yellow in the light. Something else that makes a huge difference in keycap quality is whether or not the keycap is double shot. And so as you can see here, um, this is a pretty standard keycap. Um, it's similar to the quality that you'd see on a rubber dome keyboard. And you can tell here that the legend is printed on. And that's because when we flip this keycap around, we don't see anything inside that keycap. Um, so it's basically like someone just kind of put like a durable sticker on the keycap. Um, and that means that eventually that sticker, that legend will just wear off and it'll start to fade away over time. But on the other hand, this keycap is double shot. So if we flip it over, you can see that here the legend, um, this letter is white. And so when we flip the keycap over, you can see that white coming through on the bottom. Um, and so this means that the legend is actually a solid piece of plastic. And then it's kind of coated in this outside color. Um, and so because it's a solid piece of plastic that sits within the keycap itself, it's not going to wear off. Like you can't wear off the color of your keycap. And so that makes PBT keycaps um, really durable. Now, before you go out and buy a bunch of keycaps and start looking around for things that match your style and your aesthetic, uh, one thing that you have to take into account is the layout and the size of your keyboard um, because different layouts will have different keycap sizes. So this is kind of what I was talking about with this board. We wouldn't be able to fit a normal enter key on here because everything is just the same size as opposed to like a more standard board where all of our modifier keys are all different sizes. Um, and so the way you can tell if a keycap set will work for your keyboard is by looking at the units of measurement for each keycap in that set. Um, and so keycaps are measured in units based off of the alpha keys. And so before in the talk, when I was saying that this board is all size one, so the square is one unit of measurement. Um, and so all of these would be one unit sized, except for the space bar, which would be two unit size, because you can see here, it's the width of two keycaps. Um, and so that's basically like the strategy that you wanna take is like, make sure that the keycap set that you're buying will support the size of the keycaps that you actually need. So we've talked about switches, PCBs, layouts, firmware keycaps, and there's a lot that goes into mechanical keyboards. Um, and this has kind of been like a high level overview, but also has kind of gone into more detail about how these things work. And so you can actually go out from this talk and build your own keyboard from scratch. Um, and that can sound a little intimidating, but there's lots of great resources online. Um, I'm always available to um, kind of guide people along if you ever wanna reach out via Twitter. Um, but I also wanted to provide some resources. Um, so here's a list of some resources that I found really helpful when I was first starting out um, and some great shops that I refer back to when I'm looking for parts or anything like that. Um, so I'm not affiliated with any of these sites or anything like that, but these are just good resources that I found. Um, so Novel Keys has great DIY kits, switches and keycaps, um, KBD fans, KB Paradise, um, 
are great sites too. And then of course there is the um, mechanical keyboard community on Reddit, which is very welcoming and friendly um, and always gives great advice on building new keyboards. Um, and then there is the mech market um, subreddit that people kind of use as an eBay to resell um, boards or parts or things like that. And I've um, bought and sold things from people there before and it's just always a great experience. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of get started um, in this hobby and in this community. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity to be really creative and build something that's really fun. Um, and you can kind of tailor it to your own needs. So that's kind of like the, the gist of mechanical keyboards. And I hope you've all have found this talk helpful and informative. Um, and as always, if you have any questions after this or want to talk um, more about keyboards or tech or anything like that, um, always available on Twitter and always happy to help. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. My switches are fired and keycaps are screaming. Great. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Uh, today we have Isabella Moreira here to have, do a little Q&A on keyboards. I hope you watched her awesome talk about explaining kind of the basics of mechanical keyboards and a lot of the options available to you should you be a little bit more curious about that scene. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Isabella, is what is kind of the, the main appeal for you in specifically like building your own keyboards? Yeah, so I never really got the hype until a friend of mine gave me this like ad hoc presentation during one of my parties that I invited her to. And I was like, I don't want to spend this much money on keyboards because I didn't get like, why would you do that? Um, but I love my keyboards because they just feel so nice to type on. And, you know, I'm a software engineer. I spend eight to 10 hours a day just at my desk. Um, typing away um, and so I really love the way that it makes like the typing feel but I also love just like how you, much you can customize them and they can just look really pretty and you can um, just like have a bunch of different keycap sets that match whatever aesthetic or mood you're going for. Yeah so one is a practical tool uh, most people here do a lot of typing but also it's fun to like customize in a way that you can't really with your laptop or something like that. You get to exactly. show the world a little bit more about you. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. So are you a person who prefers linear, tactical, or clicky keys? So my office mates all hate me because I prefer like the most tactile, clicky keys that you could possibly find. Um, and so my office mate, you know, he'll, he'll be in meetings and I'll be typing away and he'll be like, people in his meeting will be like, is everything okay over there? And you're just like, oh yeah, it's just her keyboard. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I feel a little bit bad, but. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I hear on calls, like your keyboard is too loud. It's like, there's no such thing. <laughs> yeah, right. So what what is the kind of um, biggest benefit of, of going all the way down into selecting every every core component versus starting with something that's kind of pre-built and just gives you like, you know, a bunch of yeah. different, like relatively nice feel. Like, what am I missing there? Yeah. So the pre-built stuff is great, especially if you're just getting started. Um, but a lot of people like to customize their keyboards, especially the switches, um, if they want to be able to have something a little bit lighter that's easier on their hands, um, or um, maybe changing the shape and the layout of the keyboard um, can just help with you know wrist pain and hand pain and things like that um, that you just get from typing for so many hours a day. And so I think that that's probably the biggest like actual practical benefit um, is finding something that's really going to be comfortable for you to use long term. Cool. In your talk, you showed some examples of the, the PCBs that you would build keyboards from. But one of our audience members, Matt, asks, how difficult is it to hand wire keyboards? Is that approachable to beginners or where do we get started with that? Yeah, I think so. Like I've 
seen plenty of people do it. I don't think that I personally have the patience. Like after um, hand soldering, like hundreds and hundreds of diodes, I'm like I don't even want to get into hand wiring a keyboard. Um, I would definitely say, um, you know, build a keyboard with like a kit or a PCB first, and then kind of once you get the hang of that, and once you're, you know, really familiar with soldering and how to debug um, where some issues may have gone if something's not working. Um, then, you know, hand wiring is something that people do all the time um, in this hobby. And there's a lot of posts on the mechanical keyboard subreddit um, that are super helpful in getting started in hand wiring. So basically, as you build your confidence in electronics, that stuff becomes a lot more obvious, like where you screwed up if you did. Absolutely, yeah. The first couple boards that I, you know, like hand built, just like I have no idea why this thing isn't working. Like I'm not an electrical engineer by any sort of um, definition, but kind of once you get comfortable kind of figuring out like, oh, the soldering, like this joint looks kind of bad. Um, like maybe this is what the issue is. Um, or like, oh, this diode wasn't flipped the right way. Uh, then you can kind of like feel a little bit more confident into doing it completely from scratch. Yeah, I love the way the, the keyboard community has that kind of gradation where it's very easy to onboard in a way that's comfortable and then you gradually get more competent and try kind of more ambitious things. Yeah, it's a very welcoming community and I've like, I've just felt like it's this completely different segment of the tech community where like everyone is welcome and even if you have a pre-built keyboard or you hand wired your own board like everything is valid and everybody is just there to help you kind of get to where you want to be next. One of our audience members, Mike, asks, have you ever tried different layouts like Colmac, Workman, Wiggle or perhaps uh, corded keyboard layouts like Velotype or Steno? Yeah, so um, there's actually a program that you can use to kind of like update the firmware on your keyboard to make it like use cords. Um, and so you can kind of get like that stenography typing experience. And so I tried that for a little bit because I just thought it was really cool um, to learn. But, you know, things like Holmark or Dvorak, it's just like, I feel like it's such a commitment and I have so many things I need to get done day to day in my job. Uh, I definitely know a lot of people who have done it um, and are like super fast typists because of it, but I feel like I just don't have the patience <laughs> to learn. Right, but you you do customize in some ways the the firmware so that you're do, using different layers, right? Yeah, so you could like have um, a keyboard where your primary layer is just QWERTY, and then you could switch into a layer that's Colmark or Dvorak. Um, and then, you know, just kind of go back and forth between them so that if you, you're like, okay, I, I'm sick of this, I just need to like actually type something, you can quickly switch back and be in your normal layout. Is that something that you, you kind of use other people's configs or you have an idea like you want a layer that's only for symbols or one layer just for numerals, something like that? Yeah, some things are like pretty heavily customized on my end. I have some layers that just have like macros for like build scripts that I use every day at work. Um, oh, cool. And they'll just like, I'll be able to, you know, cancel my like running server and I can like do a build with just one keystroke and have the server launch again. Um, so things like that are really nice, but for like more standard use cases, there's tons of layouts um, that are compatible with like firmware's like QMK that you can just go download and then, you know, upload to your, uh, to your um, keyboard. Awesome. I saw that in your, in your wall of keys that you have collected a wide variety of keycaps. Mm -hmm. So one of our audience members, Allison, asked if you've ever tried making your own custom keycaps. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, like I'm not at my office because I'm visiting family. Otherwise, like I wouldn't show you guys some of the different things that I have. Um, but I've definitely played around with designing my own keycap sets. Um, it's just like time constraints haven't let me get as far as I wanted to get. Um, but usually the way it works is like you kind of come up with some design um, that you think would be really like different and unique. Um, and then you kind of do some renderings. Um, and there's different services that will do it for you or some programs that you can use for free to do it. 
Um, and then you usually post um, either on a geek hack board or um, the mechanical uh, keyboard subreddit for an interest check um, to, you know, kind of gauge like, are people interested in this? Are there things that I should modify about it before getting it out to the public? And then kind of once that happens, you can find some manufacturer to kind of help you distribute it or go through um, a company like MassDrop um, to, you know, get the resources to actually get this built and out to people. So it's a bit of an involved process for sure. A lot of those uh, like group buys, for instance, are kind of community sourced rather than like here is a keyboard company and we are handing you these keys. It sounds like it's a like an iterative process from from makers who just want to make something cool. Yeah, and I think that's the great thing about the keyboard community is that it's pretty much all community driven. Like there's very few things that are run by these major companies. Um, but yeah, like a lot of these sets are just creators that get together and they're like, we want to build this thing. And then they just go and make it happen. And sometimes they'll have to partner with bigger companies to like get their ideas manufactured. Um, but for the most part, like it's all very community driven, which is really cool. Awesome. We had a comment from Abhishek that says one of his colleagues got his co-working subscription canceled because of blue switches. <laughs> you know, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so so that leads us to uh what what is your favorite switch from from like stem to o-ring to lube to grams of force the whole spec are you making your own custom ones that aren't available what do you like um so i've played around with kind of like making some different combinations like tearing down switches um but when you're like building out a full board, I personally find it very tedious to go and like customize 80 something switches. Um, but I really love um, box switches. So uh, Kale has this line um, where they're basically like, like IPS rated switches uh, because they have this basically like this box around the like the stem, like the plus um, of the uh, switch. Um, but they make some really heavy like box jades, which are just like super like thocky. <laughs> um, and so those have been really cool, but there's always some random, uh, random switches that you'll find out there that there's one that's like a, like a Tiffany blue, uh, linear switches. Um, and a lot of them that like the typing experience might not be like really different from like a very standard like cherry switch um but they're like built to be very like aesthetically different so that if you have um a keyboard where you can see some of the switches like you can get it to match whatever theme you're going for which is pretty cool how did you get a sense for like the, the typing feel of some of these different switches because i know that a lot of places will sell like uh some testers that give you kind of like a board with like 10 or 12 or, or 16 mm -hmm. different switches, but it, it's quite different, like pressing with one finger, say, I guess that's okay. And then yeah. when you put it on a full board, you feel like this is awful or this is <laughs> Like I could never do this. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. like those like testing pads are really great to just like kind of get an idea. But like you said, it's kind of hard to envision what it'll be like on a full keyboard. So the way that I kind of found out about these things, um, yeah, mechanical keyboards are a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, the way that I like really got comfortable with this is um, just by going to local keyboard meetups. Um, mm. And you know, people will do like talks and stuff and then we'll have basically this big expo where everyone will just bring keyboards and then set them up on tables. Um, and they'll have little like cards of, you know, the name of the keyboard and the type of switches that they have and what keycaps are on them. Um, and you can just go around the expo and just type on everybody's keyboard um, and you can kind of get a feel of like, oh, this was really cool. I'm going to like take note of that. So I know that like that might not be a very popular thing um, where certain people are, but I think like finding some sort of community where like, you know, you can kind of share uh, boards or experiences um, is really helpful. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge right now, but as long as you bring hand sanitizer, I think just sanitize. It sounds like it has to be in person. Try everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
Matt asks, um, if you if you go outside to work, uh, for instance, in a cafe, do you still bring a mechanical keyboard? Is that like a practical setup? Um, I personally, like, I have seen people that bring like monitors and keyboards to their coffee shops, and I'm just like, Whoa. what are you people doing? <laughs> this is not your home office. Um, I, I think the like, if your keyboard is quiet enough, like if maybe you're using like linear or like very subtle um, tactile switches, it can be a totally reasonable thing. I personally don't because I know that my keyboards are very loud and I'm not trying to be kicked out. <laughs> um, but I've definitely seen people do it. Man is wondering what your favorite keycap profile is. I think you touched on this briefly in your talk. Yeah, so I really like um, the very sculpted keycaps. So I like essays, um, but there's also kind of a new um, profile that's come out recently. Um, I think it's the MT3, and it's basically just like a really sculpted version of the essay profile. So it's kind of hard to find keycaps in that profile. Um, so kind of like my default always falls back to essay. I had kind of a weird question. Um, you described the kind of units for keys in mm -hmm. the sense that normally the, the alphanumeric keys are a certain size and we call that one and then larger keys become 1.5 or two kind of units. Is, is there any keyboard companies that are offering that one unit in different sizes, for example, for larger or smaller hands or is that very much like standardized on one set? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think I've ever seen sets that you can customize to have just like a larger base unit where like your standard like one unit alpha keys are, you know, maybe twice the size. Um, but yeah, I think that's actually like a really interesting point of like, how can we you know, make keyboards more accessible to people that may have maybe like um, problems with like motor um, skills and things like that um, to make sure that like they yeah. have something that they feel comfortable typing in. Exactly. I, I bought a keyboard at quite a steep discount from a person who said like, this is just too, uh, too large for my hands. Hmm. So his hands are smaller and there was like a different keyboard that would have worked better for him. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point. I never thought about it. Abhishek says he's going to be bankrupt by mid twenty twenty two. Keyboards can be so, so expensive, <laughs> but it's kind of nice because like a lot of things come in the form of group buys, and so you know you'll you'll spend a couple hundred dollars in a group buy and then like six to eight months later a package shows up and you're like oh my god like surprise. <laughs> It's like yeah, thanks surprise Christmas me. in random months of the year. Yeah. Michaela's asking if you uh, have tried in like different percent keyboards, so like 40%, 60%, etc. Yeah, so I started with 60%. Um, I don't like anything too big. Um, I found that that was like a little bit restricted. Um, I still like really like having arrow keys. Um, and with a 60%, you can like, you know, toggle onto a different layer really quick and then use like IJKL um, as your arrow keys. But um, mm -hmm. for a long time now, I've been using mostly like 65%. Um, so it's basically like your standard modifiers, your number row, and then an arrow key cluster with a couple extra um, keys next to it that you can kind of like customize to be whatever you want. Um, and I find that that's like a pretty good middle ground. Um, I don't like having the numpad and I don't like having the function row. Um, and the numpad specifically is so that I can keep my mouse as close as possible to me so I don't have to, you know, like reach across um, my keyboard to get to it. Yeah, so basically when you go smaller, you need to compensate in other ways, for instance, using several layers of keys, maybe have more modifiers that you're hitting one key and then it's a chord like control F instead of just having one button that does find, for instance. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of have to get a little bit more creative. Um, I have, you know, the tiny keyboard that I showed in my talk, the plank. Um, and 
I would use that like day to day for a while and people would come at my desk and I would have to pull out like the standard keyboard and be like, okay, you can use this while you're at my desk because no one knew like how the layers worked or anything. Yeah. Georgie says that you mentioned earlier heavier switch keys being a workout. So what are kind of the advantages of those like cherry black and, and things that approach, you know, 70, 80 grams of resistive force? Yeah, so some of it is like, you know, a lot of gamers will use very light switches because you can just like, you know, barely touch the key and it will do whatever thing you want in the game. I'm not a gamer, I don't know, but this is what I hear. Um, and so kind of like for the opposite reason, if you have a heavier switch and you're someone who, you know, maybe likes to rest your hands on the keyboard a lot, um, you won't have just keys accidentally firing off. Um, but a lot of it comes down to a personal preference, like how much force do you actually want to be able to put down on a key. Um, and I've gone to some meetups where um, people have built out custom switches that are like 180 grams. And you're like, wow, Whoa. this is extreme. Um, so it's all about personal preference. <laughs> yeah. So in your in your wide variety of boards, do you find yourself kind of switching between them? Are they all running now like the same switches that you know you love everywhere? Or is it just like personality, like kind of putting on an outfit from day to day? Yeah, I think it's more like putting on an outfit, but I, I think I, I rotate out between keyboards like maybe every month or two. Um, there can be like some cognitive load to like switching between keyboards so often because you're like, oh yeah, and this keyboard, like this is how I type things and these are what my macros and my layers look like. Um, so I try not to switch between them too often, um, but they pretty much all have different switches and different layouts and they all kind of feel a little bit different to type on. So it's really just like, oh, I want to switch things up this month. Let me pick this board off from my wall and, and switch to using that for a bit. And finally, I think we have the real question. Is this really an addiction? And if we're already there, how do we get out? Yes, um, I, I do think that it can be a very addictive hobby. Like there's just so many options and so many different things that you can buy and you can get into things like custom switches and custom wrist rests and you know coiled cables. And there's just like, all sorts of little accessories that you can kind of go down in the rabbit hole to. Um, but, you know, I think it's all about being very honest with yourself. I'm like, do I really need this new keyboard or new accessory? Um, and, you know, there's always um, the, the mech market subreddit where you can go and trade with other people or sell your current setup to be able to buy something new. Um, and so I, I think it's a balance, you know. I, I'm a little terrified to do the math on like how much I've personally spent on my setups, um, but I've definitely like stopped buying things for a while just because I have like a box in my closet that's just like full of extra stuff that I'm like, okay, I should settle down for a bit. Well, we had one last question come in from Supacon regarding high and low profile keyboards like Keychron. Do you have any recommendation on those or do you have a preference or a recommendation? Um, I don't think I have like a specific recommendation. It, it kind of affects like how the typing feels and kind of like the angle that your wrists sit at. And, you know, depending on if you use a wrist rest or not, um, you know, that could play a factor into it. But I personally always use a wrist rest um, because I prefer high profile boards. Um, I just like things that feel really sturdy and like if, you know, my my dog like were to knock something off the my desk that like it would be fine. Um, and so I prefer like high profile, like really like thick and heavy switches, like really high profile keycaps. Um, but a lot of people prefer like the very minimalist route. Um, and there's also one line of uh, low profile switches that kind of look and feel more like laptop um, keyboard switches. Um, so if like you really want it to go low profile, like there are a lot of options out there for you too. Awesome. Georgie says we need to create a keyboard rehab center for all the people watching today. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Isabella, for your talk and the Q&A today.
Yeah, thanks everyone for the great questions.